He is risen as he told us. Oh, it's like a dream, but, but I know I'm awake. Wait, let me catch my breath. I want to tell you what has happened, and I want you to hear it from a woman's voice. Peter and John might burst in here at any moment with their stories, but I want you to hear it from me first, Mary Magdalene. I rose before dawn. I wanted to reach the tomb before the mother of our Lord could begin to prepare her son's body for burial. How she has come through the past few days astounds me. Watching her firstborn, welcomed, betrayed, mocked, and crucified. Somehow sustained by a fierce love for her son and her maker. I have carried the supplies to the tomb, wondering all the way who could roll away the stone. In my haste, I had overlooked that rather obvious detail. I got to the tomb, and the stone was rolled away. The tomb was open, but the body, where was the body? Peter and John were on the path. I ran to them. They have taken away our Lord. I don't know where he is. They ran on to the tomb. I don't know what they saw or heard. That is their story to tell. I do know I was grieving by the tomb. I stopped and looked in the door. Two angels in white sat on the ledge, one where his head would have been, one where his tortured feet had laid. They asked me, woman, why are you crying? Why was I crying? Why was I crying? I was, I was weeping, not only for the loss of his precious life, but to be denied the simple dignity of a proper burial, cruelty beyond belief. How long he stood there, I cannot say, but his question was the same. Woman, why are you crying? For whom are you looking? I kept myself from screaming at him and said, Sir, if you've taken the body, show me where it is and I will care for it. Through my tears, I couldn't see who spoke. I thought it was the gardener. Then he spoke my name, Mary. Heartbeat and breath were suspended in that moment of recognition. I turned toward him. Rabbi, teacher, I meant to hold him, but he backed away. No, Mary, do not touch me, but go. Go tell the others, I ascend to my Father in heaven. Tell them, I have been raised from the dead. I ran back to tell all of you, he is alive. I have seen the Lord. I wanted to shout it from the rooftops, but as you know, it isn't safe for public celebrations right now. Now isn't the time to proclaim the good news in grand, bold ways. Perhaps now we serve our risen Lord best in our daily routines, quietly. The time for dancing and shouting will come. I bring you good news. I have seen the Lord.
all, all the time. time. And all the time, God, God is good. good. Let us all give thanks to the Lord, for God is good. Let all the people proclaim God's steadfast love endures forever. God's, God's steadfast, steadfast love endures, endures forever. The Lord is my strength, my song, and my salvation. Shouts of joy resound in the tents of the righteous. God's, God's steadfast, steadfast love endures forever. He is with us in our time of need. The Lord's right hand has done mighty things. We, we will, will not die, die but, but live. We, we will proclaim what the Lord has done. We enter the gates of the Lord and give thanks. For this is the day the Lord has made. Let, Let us rejoice, rejoice and be glad in it. He is risen. Christ is risen. He, he is, is risen, risen indeed. indeed. Let us all pray. Holy and living God, like a tomb's darkness that gives way to light, open us this day to newness of life. Open us to your love, to your acceptance, to your forgiveness, to your peace. Open us to one another and to the possibilities that we have in store for us. Give us hope for the future and a passion for life here and now. We pray in the name of the one who destroyed death, Jesus Christ, our Savior, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the power forever. Amen. This morning, I wanted to talk to the kids that were in our pastor's class that we started almost two months ago, which got rudely interrupted by this coronavirus. Today was the day about 12 kids, 11 kids and one adult were to be baptized. And it breaks my heart that it cannot happen today. And so I wanted to uh, lift up these names, uh, Henry, Lindy, Betty Ann, China, Brooklyn, Aniston, Abby, Lexi, Old Man Scott, Addison, Chase, and Lindsay. There will be another day where we can celebrate your baptism together. I don't know if it's going to be in a month, two months, three months, or when it will be. But this I can promise. Just as Jesus rose from the dead on Easter, we will celebrate your baptism. And it will be a joyous day. So I'd like to thank you and, and ask that you continue to study your materials uh, that you were given for pastor's class. And when we get back together, we'll meet for a couple of weeks, and uh, then you can make the choice about when you would like to be baptized. See you guys later. Baptism and Easter go hand in hand. Baptism is that time in our life where we make that decision that we are going to die to our sin 
that we are going to be buried in the watery grave of baptism, and we, like Jesus, rise again to a new life. That's what these elements here are for, and this is why Easter is the greatest day in the Christian year. If all we had was Christmas and no Easter, Jesus' birth would be minimal at best. But because we have Easter, because we have the resurrected Jesus, we live a new life, a life of meaning and purpose. And we gather here at this table to remember his body and his blood. Death did not have the final word on Jesus' life. He rose again, and we too rise again. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took a loaf of bread. And after he blessed it, he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, and he said, Take and eat every one of you, for this is my body, which is broken for you. In a like manner, after the supper, Jesus took a cup of wine. And after he blessed it, he gave it to his disciples, and he said, Take and drink, every one of you, for this is the blood of my new covenant, which is poured out for you. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, as people gather in their homes this day, some still in their pajamas, celebrating Easter, we look back to that night of the Passover where Jesus made that decision that he would give up his life to serve all of humanity. That he would not fight the powers of evil on their terms, but on God's terms. We ask, O oh God, that as we receive this bread, this broken body of Christ, that we will eat it in such a way that we will remember that we too are asked to make sacrifices. And we remember this cup, this cup which represents the pouring out of Jesus' blood, washing away sin. We thank you, God, that we are able, no matter where we are, to celebrate this meal together. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. from the book of Matthew, chapter 28, verses 1 through 10. After the Sabbath, as the first day of the week was dawning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descending from heaven came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothing white as snow. For fear of him, the guards shook and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid. I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. For he has been raised, as he said. Come, see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples. He has been raised from the dead, and indeed he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There he will, you will see him. This is my message for you. So they left the tomb quickly with fear and great joy and ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly Jesus met them and said, Greetings! And they came to him, took hold of his feet, and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. I'm one of the biggest skeptics I know that I've ever known. I don't 
buy into conspiracy theories. Matter of fact, I try to poke holes in them. When I hear someone make some sort of outlandish story, I, I quickly dismiss it. I laugh every time I hear there's a UFO sightings. I understand they get more of those in Arkansas than any place else. I laugh when I hear that there might be intelligent forms of life on other planets. And I laugh because I'm still looking for intelligent forms of life here. I politely giggle every time someone tells me that they believe in ghosts or demons. I'm mystified by how gullible people can be falling for whatever the newest fad is and spending their life savings on a miracle cure to postpone death. Do you remember the woman in Florida, this was a few years ago, who was eating a grilled cheese sandwich and she noticed as she bit into it, she saw the face of the Virgin Mary in a half-eaten sandwich. She held on to that sandwich for 10 years and then sold it on eBay. About $28,000 is the price of a half-eaten sandwich in Florida. There's also been quite a few Jesus sightings over the last few years. Last year, many people, myself included, saw Jesus in flames as the Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris was burning. Jesus has also been seen in oyster shells, uh, dental x-rays. Someone saw Jesus in a chihuahua's ear, and a tortilla, and a pierogi, a uh, Polish pierogi, to name just a few. The pierogi sold for a miserly $1,700 on eBay. Now, some Christians are claiming the coronavirus is a sign that the world is about to end, and Jesus is right around the corner. For someone who died 2,000 years ago, Jesus sure makes a lot of appearances in peculiar places and in peculiar times. So what do we do? What do skeptics do with the Easter story? Jesus has been crucified on a cross by Roman soldiers. And following his death, he was placed in a sealed tomb guarded by soldiers to make sure that the friends of Jesus did not steal the body. A couple of women went to the tomb early, Sunday morning, in order to anoint the body of Jesus for a proper burial, to cover up that smell of death, so that Jesus could die and be buried with dignity. And when they arrived at the tomb, there was a, a great earthquake, followed by the appearance of an angel that looked like lightning, dressed in bright white clothes. The angel assured them that they have nothing to fear, although I know I would have feared a lot, that Jesus had risen from the dead and that they should go and tell others that Jesus is going to make an appearance. And as they left, Jesus approaches them and they hit down on their knees to worship him and they grab a hold of his feet. And I love how in John's account, Mary Magdalene tries to hold on to the feet of Jesus, but Jesus adamantly says, Ma'am, I'm practicing social distancing. Get away from my feet. Now, most people don't have a problem with the death of Jesus. Our problem is the resurrection. Nearly all of us have experienced death to one degree or another whether it be a parent or a child, a sibling, a friend, or a pet. Some of you have had that experience recently. And so you know how powerful death can be. I've been to numerous death vigils as people breathe their last and the family gathered around to say their goodbyes. I've been to too many of those. But people are there to support each other, not just to support the one who is dying, but to offer each other support. I've performed countless funerals and seen too many coffins lowered into the ground and ashes scattered. But not once, 
Not once have I ever experienced a resurrection from the dead. And I seriously doubt that any of you have either. You see, the, the concept of resurrection, it's not rational. It's incomprehensible to believe that dead people rise from the grave. But I do believe in resurrection. Like some of you, I've experienced the risen Christ in my life. During times in my life when I was depressed and alone and I and just wish I were dead. I, I experienced God's love and God's presence holding on to me as if a close friend were holding me that close. I witnessed firsthand the miracle of the birth of my children. I assisted drug addicts moving off of dependency on drugs and destroying their life and having their lives restored, their careers restored, their families restored. I've assisted addicts and sex workers who have turned their life around and received their children. I have counseled couples on the brink of divorce to rebuild their marriage. And I've seen marriages die with new life and re relationships resurrected. The reason we celebrate the resurrection on Easter Sunday is because that same spirit of the risen Christ in me and in you and in all, all people who have experienced it, this continuing presence of Jesus 2,000 years after his death. I believe in the Savior who died on the cross to break the power of everything that threatens to enslave us or oppress us, distort or destroy humanity including this horrible virus and pandemic. I believe in a God who takes our pain and sorrow and feels it with us and is there with us. A God who experiences suffering and sadness, loss and death, but then is able to turn it into new life. I believe in the new life that came into being that Easter morning and that will one day transform everything and everyone. I believe in a God who never ever abandons anybody. And I believe in a God who brings hope out of hopelessness and new life out of death. But because I believe in this God, the God who raised Jesus from the dead, there are some things that I just, I just refuse to believe in. I refuse to believe in eternal death and in eternal hell, as if they were somehow more real than God's love and God's presence and God's gift of new life. I refuse to believe that death gets the last word in our lives. I refuse to believe that I am defined by my illnesses, my shortcomings. For I believe that God has the last word in everyone's life. And God will not allow the worst of things to triumph over the best of things. Ultimately, love wins. At the end of the day, it seems to me that the real meaning of Easter is the continuing presence of Christ in all our lives. Not Jesus was born, but Jesus is. Easter is like a promise that points toward a future filled with hope and joy and love and life. It is a promise that we can all begin to experience right here and right now because Jesus is alive and well in us all. I believe that resurrection is for real. And that is why we will not allow the power of a pandemic to defeat us. Because we know that Jesus can overcome and is overcoming through staying at home, through the care of doctors and nurses, through the care of those who are in public health, for those teachers who are teaching online, for everyone who is doing what they can, like Sandy Brown making this mask. I believe 
in this power of resurrection. That no matter how defeated we may feel, that Christ has the power to triumph over everything, including death. Amen. Savior.